If you like the video make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. For more videos like this, people who have encountered unknown creatures, otherworldly beings, tall, pale cryptids, etc., share your experiences with us. The facts narrated here happened to my cousin many years ago. She lived near Sorocaba, Sao Paulo State, in a very peaceful neighborhood. At night, the streets are all empty, and you can barely see any bystanders or cars passing by. It was at night in the middle of a week. She had a friend in her house watching movies, but the friend decided to go home because both of them had to go to work tomorrow early. So, my cousin and friend went to the bus stop, circa 2011 p.m. When my cousin was coming back from the bus stop, she saw another person 30 meters away, across the street. She could not see him very well, but it looked like he was a large man with dark attire and a child. She didn't see any children, but the man made noises as if he were talking with a baby or child, so she assumed a child was with him. My cousin continued to walk and saw the man walking three footsteps, then turning right, walking three footsteps again, turning right, and so on. Then she saw that the man was alone. When she approached, she saw him holding something silvery and long. Now she got very scared because she saw he was faceless, a white mass where his face was supposed to be. She ran away. My grandfather served in World War II. He was on a Navy destroyer. He served with a gentleman, and they were heading to Japan. It turns out they had to tour Japan before they were going to do the invasion, so it was a good thing for them. They moved back here to Tennessee, and my grandfather's friend had bought a house out on a farm out here in Jonesboro, about 20 minutes south of me. They noticed there were some really weird things going on at the house when they first moved, but they never really thought too much of it. They would hear knocking on the door at night, that kind of stuff. Well, one night they were sleeping in bed, and he hears this blood-curdling shriek from outside in the back forest, there's a wooded area back there right behind his farmhouse, it sounds like a woman being murdered. So, this guy's not afraid of anything, I mean, he was about to be faced with death going to fight the Japanese, so he takes this shotgun out and goes out into the backyard, and he looks around. He sees this pair of yellowish eyes staring at him. This isn't a pole sticking out of the ground that's three or four feet off the ground, this is about six feet five and just the yellow, that's all you could see. He took one look at it, and he said, point blank. He shot it right between the eyes, and it didn't even flinch. It just looked at him. He could not make out a shape. All he could see were the eyes, and he said they almost looked cat-like. This happened in Mexico to my grandpa, he is still alive and sharp as a tack. He has been a rancher his whole life and owns land and cattle in Mexico. One night he was walking home from locking up his cows, and he noticed someone was following him, but it wasn't someone, it was a lot of very short people, as he described them. He knew what they were because he had heard stories. He was scared, but he ignored them that first time and just kept walking like normal, and they left him alone, all they would do was follow him. However, after that night, they would follow him home every night, and this went on for a week until he came up with an idea to catch one. This was a rural area, so no one believed him when he told someone about the duendes. He decided since they followed him that he would run ahead of them and hide behind the corner of a building, and as they ran past, he would reach out and grab one. So he saw them following him again, and he ran ahead, hid, and waited for them. He waited and waited. After a while, he realized they weren't running past his hiding point, so he came out to see where they were, and he realized they were gone. After that night, he said he never saw them again. That area has a lot of very hard to explain things. My mom still tells me stories that shock me. I moved to the US from the capital of a Scandinavian country not too long ago. I know there is tons of Scandinavian lore about various creatures and beings, but over here in the US, it just feels like they are so much more prevalent and common. However, from what I have read, most of these creatures tend to live in less populated areas, and I live in a busy part of Hollywood. Have anyone ever heard any lore about humanoid beings in Hollywood? It is a neighborhood that is very close to the Hollywood Hills, if that helps. Now to the encounter, I was walking home from a grocery run, it was approximately 10.30 pm on my street, there is only one side that has fully functioning street lighting, and the other side has a few lights that work, but even those that do tend to flicker and die a lot of the time. Oh, and this side also has alleyways and dark passages. Beautiful, right? So naturally, when living in a city with a high crime rate, I walk on the side with fully functional lighting and no scary alleyways at this late hour, but for some reason, tonight I chose to walk down the darker side of the street. I get almost halfway to my house when I see that under one of the flickering lights, a figure steps out of an alleyway, one long step, and it has traveled almost 8 feet directly under the street light. 
I would usually shrug it off as a random pedestrian, but its proportions were super off. The torso was super short, like too short to physically fit your organs, but the legs were long, and the arms too. I could not distinguish any facial features, it was rather dark outside, not saying it didn't have any facial features, and it moved in a very stiff and unhuman-like manner, which instantly made me feel something was off, so I crossed the street. It just stood under the light for a moment, until I walked past a large car, and it was gone. I feel like it did not intend to harm, or that it definitely hadn't come for me at least, but it still made me a bit uneasy. I tried looking for it when I passed the alleyway it had stepped out of, but I could not see Jack Squat. My cousin and I were often at my grandparents in upstate New York, where we lived. Out in the country, they owned about 20 acres of old farmland, so there were many open spaces and about 5 acres of wood that my grandpa used to log. One night, me, my dad, my aunt, my uncle, and my cousin were camping at the cabin at the edge of the biggest field on the land, as we usually do during the summer. At about 10 to 11, my dad, cousin, and I decided to go for a small walk to the other end of the field conjoined to the large field. Outside expanses have always unnerved me, especially at night, so I was reluctant, but I went anyway. Once we crested the knoll and turned the corner from the cabin so a small hedgerow was blocking us from eyeshot, we began to hear a violent rustling from the woods along with branches snapping, so we all stopped. Once we stopped, two large creatures, one large one and a smaller one, ran by us close enough for all of us to feel the wind blow by. These things were bipedal and fast. Faster than any biped I have ever heard of. They ran about 20 or 30 yards away from us, all now frozen with fear and shock, and stopped, then turned to look at us once they felt they were at a safe distance. They just stood there, silent, with a curious or possibly frightened gaze, for what seemed like forever. They then turned and ran at the same speed for the rest of the 150 yards in a minute, as I said, they were extremely fast. As I have grown up, I have realized that many odd things can be seen and heard in rural New York, but this was the first and last sighting of this kind I had experienced. I used to go camping at Puttenwell Lake, Adams Company Campground, every year. One year, probably about 88-89, myself, a younger sister, and two cousins went for a walk after dark, maybe about 10 p.m. we were young, myself and a cousin were 8 to 9, and the other two were 6 to 7. There were some dirt walking trails in the woods around the campground. It was near the lake, and two trails intersected with a little clearing, maybe 5 to 6 feet on the sides of the trails. We could see a pontoon boat filled with people. Our young, dumb selves figured they were a search party looking for someone, maybe even us, because we were not supposed to be away from camp that late. I now know it was just people having a good time. As we were watching them, looking down the path going towards the lake, we stayed out of sight. A light orb came from through the woods, right to us. We were frozen in place. It was bigger than a softball and smaller than a basketball. It came in and circled us twice, probably six to eight feet off the ground, and left. The whole thing was maybe five to ten seconds long. I can remember it so vividly, like it happened yesterday. I wanted to share something that happened to me when I was 11 or 12 years old. We had a house fire and had to move in with my grandmother for a time while the insurance was sorted and our new house was built. Luckily, the land my grandmother owned had an old farm house near her home that she mostly used for storage. It had water and electricity, so we were good to go. The first few nights in the house were very scary for me. Every little pop or flash of light made me think of fire. I slept between my parents each night. It was rough, but after about three or four nights, I was no longer scared while I was in the house. I even started going upstairs in the evenings and reading in the loft while listening to the radio. I decided that I was able to sleep alone in the house and spent a few nights on the old couch in the living room. After that, I ended up in the loft, using a sleeping bag borrowed from one of my cousins. Anyway, the loft had a massive window facing the front yard, driveway, and main road. I was just settling in for the night with my little lantern and my book when something passed by the window. I shrugged it off as the reflection of a car going by and started reading my book. It happened again, and this time I got up and went to the window. This is where it gets weird. Standing in the middle of the yard was a deer. It stood on its hind legs, and its neck was bent at an odd angle, like it was broken or something. It walked with a strange grace, especially for something that appeared to be so out of place, through grass, across the road, and disappeared into the woods. At no point during seeing this creature was I afraid. I was actually very calm somehow and even went to my sleeping bag and went back to my reading, not even thinking about what I had just seen. This is really out of character for me, to say the least. I'm the type to get worked up over seeing a bug in the house. The next morning, 
I told my mother what I saw, and she seemed totally unaffected. She just told me not to tell anyone and sent me off to school. I assumed she thought I was seeing things due to the stress of the fire, but I know exactly what I saw, and I was not dreaming or even close to falling asleep when it happened. We moved to our new house about three weeks after I saw the deer. I've only told a few people about what happened, and I've never seen anything like that since, but I am terrified of going into the woods. When I think about it now, it's super scary, and I'm not sure why I was so calm. This was a while ago, but one day me and my brother were walking through some very thin woods and had just crossed a bridge when we saw a very tall, 8 or 9 feet, give or take, big, dark creature barreling through the trees at top speed towards the water of the creek. I didn't see much else because we bolted out of there as fast as we could. A couple days ago, I recalled this event and talked to a friend about it, and he suggested it might have been the Missouri monster, Momo. It was around midday in southeast, Missouri. It was a pretty brief encounter. I'm not sure if it noticed us or not, and I didn't think much of it until now. It couldn't have been a bear either, because we weren't deep enough into the woods, and it wasn't even a proper forest. More like a cluster of trees along with a creek, plus it was way too big and fast to be a human. This happened a few years ago at my parents' house, in a small town in Wayne County. Anyone who knows the area knows that some parts are very rural. Well, my parents live right in town, not far from the center of it, but in a weird spot. The town only has maybe 500 people within its limits, and it's surrounded by farmland and forests. They live right near the railroad tracks and canal, and their backyard is pitch black at night because the street lights don't reach back there. The yard backs up to a walking trail and woods, it's actually pretty creepy back there after dark, even though it's two blocks from downtown. The night this story takes place, it was extremely dark, I think it was a new moon or a moonless night, and it was overcast to boot. Late summer or early fall, so it was pretty dry, there was no mud to capture any footprints. My parents, brother, and I were talking in the living room at the front of the house, the part of the house facing town and light. The house is kind of long and skinny, maybe 30 or 40 feet wide, but probably 120 to 150 feet long. As we're talking, the family dog stands up, looks around, and starts to growl really low. He was a yellow lab, about 90 pounds, half deaf, and blind from diabetes. Overall, he was a really chill dog. He'd never bark at other dogs, and he very rarely barks at people. That's what made this so odd. His cackles went up, and he started barking towards the back of the house. There are at least two closed doors before you even get to the room where the back door is. The dog is now like a full-on bear, barking at the closed door in the hallway. We opened it and followed him to see why he was going nuts. We get to the door to the back room and are now worried someone has broken in, but when we opened it, Marley shot straight to the back door. Jumping, barking, and snarling. I've never heard this big baby of a dog make sounds. I opened the back door, and he tried to bolt out. He was going to attack whoever or whatever was out there. Me and my parents step out on the back porch and close Marley inside. He still sounds almost ducking rabid. We wait a second for our eyes to adjust because the backyard is pitch black. We see a silhouette, maybe 40 or 50 feet away, standing at the edge of the yard, right near the railroad track access road. Now, to say this thing was big is an understatement. It was way over 6 feet tall, probably closer to 7 and a half inches, and extremely broad. I'd think it was a potential burglar that we caught sneaking up on the house if it wasn't so ducking massive. My parents to this day swear it was a black bear. Officially, according to the deck, black bears don't live anywhere near this area and haven't for a long time. Also, the size of it would have been a record-sized bear. Also, the reaction of my dog going nuts doesn't seem like what a bear would do. After we had put Marley inside it, just. We stood there, upright, for about two minutes before we decided it was best to go inside as the hairs on the back of our necks were standing up. The reason it freaked me out was that even at a distance, you could hear its breath. Deep, raspy breaths. It sounded like it was breathing right next to my ear. They were slow and steady, not like someone who was out of breath. It wasn't like they were trying to make their breath sound loud, it just was. I immediately went to find a flashlight, but when? I got back outside, and whatever it was was gone. No tracks, no fur, just a huge silhouette that was too big to be a person but acted unlike any wild animal I've ever encountered. My grandpa was telling me a story in the summertime, I believe it happened in the 1960s. It happened near the Sandy Bay Aboriginal Reserve, which is in southern Manitoba. It was midwinter, and Manitoba gets plenty of snow. My grandpa told me his two friends, a wife and husband, were walking from their car to their house carrying all of their luggage. 
It was just their cabin, not their house, so they were carrying the luggage up to the cabin. The first thing they noticed was a bright, bright light shining into the cabin. It illuminated the entire cabin and was a fluorescent shade of icy blue. The husband thought he saw the silhouette of a strange, tall humanoid in the house. It was lanky and very tall, standing alone, before it walked out of sight. Quickly, he ran into the house with his wife, they searched the house, and there was nothing. So, the wife went back out to grab more luggage. The husband said he heard a shriek from outside and quickly ran out to make sure she was okay. He was shocked to find her footprints leading up to the car, yet she was about 25 feet away from the car in the woods, with no tracks leading towards her. If she were to walk out there herself, her tracks would obviously be there. He ran out to her. She was distraught and hollering and screaming, and her eyes were glazed over. He took her in, and she refused to speak. She was admitted to a mental hospital soon after, and to this day she has the same glossed over eyes and still can't speak. She experienced a horrible trauma out there, and I believe it's because of whatever the humanoid creature was. My grandpa still talks to her husband sometimes, and I believe he visited her about 30 years ago at the hospital, since he doesn't live too many hours away. I had this old century house in Missouri where it had all of these outbuildings like barns, sheds, and a chicken coop. The whole place always felt weird, but especially the chicken coop. It was so bad that my parents didn't even let me within 500 feet of the chicken coop. That area felt like hell and full of dread. What really set stuff off was when me and my cousin saw this skin-colored, naked human figure inside the old chicken coop through the window. I saw this thing a few times, and it always seemed like it was pacing in there. Me and my whole family kept our distance from that place, so I don't know if it ever noticed or cared about us. The farmhouse was built in Battlefield, Missouri, where a large battle from the Civil War took place, so I think this thing could have been the ghost or spirit of a dead soldier. This can also be further evident by my aunt, who says there was the ghost of a boy wearing a Confederate uniform who was trapped in one of the bathrooms. Around 1991, in Hillsborough County, Florida, my mother, one of my cousins, and I were coming back from a school concert. At the time, we lived in a rural part of the county. We were three miles from our home when my mother hit the brakes really hard. I was in the back seat sleeping, and my cousin was sleeping on the front passenger side. I heard a hard thump, and then mom hit the gas. I asked what happened. She screamed out, I just hit a werewolf. My cousin's eyes were wide open, and she wouldn't talk at all. My mother told me more details when we got home. Before she hit it, she noticed a car on the side of the road up ahead. When she came up to it, the creature jumped right in front of our car. She was going about 45 when she hit the brakes. It landed on the hood of the car. Its face landed on the windshield. It had black fur and red eyes, a long mouth open to reveal a large set of teeth. Definitely not a guy in a suit. It pushed itself off the car, leaving claw marks. My mother told me that the last time there was one in the area was over 20 years ago. I believe it was in 2001. I worked maintenance between 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. for about a week, I heard weird sounds coming from the back of the building, which has a thick brush. Not the typical animal sounds. One night, I heard a loud crash coming from the side entrance. I investigated to find a large garbage can that was thrown on top of the roof and rolled off. I was thinking kids until I got a strong whiff of something nasty. It wasn't the trash. Then I was thinking, skunk ape. I quickly picked up all the trash and went back into the building. The next night, I was traveling between the two buildings when the thick bushes started shaking. I heard an animal make a horrible sound, like it was being choked. I ran into the lighted parking lot and turned around. I saw a large humanoid shape appear out of the brush, and it went back in. A couple nights later, my mother was waiting to pick me up when she saw a large shape come in under a light by a side entrance. It suddenly noticed her and went back into the shadows. A week passed without incident. Again, my mother was waiting to pick me up when she heard a couple of dogs barking close by. She turned to see a large, hooded man walking behind the car. He was across the parking lot on the side of the road. The dogs belonged to a couple of trailer folks nearby. These dogs travel in packs of four to five and weigh between 60 and 90 pounds they were running around the man, barking, and snapping at him. One of the large dogs got hold of his arm. Then my mother saw the man's face, it wasn't a man under that hood. The head of a black wolf became visible. The unearthly being shook and then threw that dog like a doll. The rest of the dogs ran for their lives. The hooded creature walked into the nearby woods. The next night was a full moon, and I heard its unearthly howl. We never heard or saw it again. Now a housing project occupies the land where it once lived. It's been years since this encounter. I am now 28 years old and residing in Georgia, but at the time of the story, 
I was about 13 in South Mississippi, where this took place. So many years ago, my parents got divorced. When my parents split, my dad moved in with my grandmother and my younger brother in Mississippi. My mom had moved across the state line to Alabama. No more than 40 miles apart. I decided to move in with my mom, but I visited my dad every weekend because they agreed upon joint custody. Where my dad and my grandmother lived, that road had a lot of relatives of ours living down the road. Now, from the beginning of the road to the end, it is honestly about 15 or 20 miles, but our relatives lived starting with us at the beginning, and the last relative of our family lived about two miles deep on that same road. For pretty much the first two miles of this road, I knew it and had family on either side. So riding bikes or walking was very common for us kids at the time. Also, there is not much to worry about getting abducted due to the relatives. My last relative on this two-mile stretch was by far my favorite to visit at this part of my life. My aunt and uncle lived there, along with my cousin, who was only three years older than me. My cousin and I were close, I mean, so close. Every time I'd visit my dad, I'd get there, visit for about 30 minutes, and then walk or ride my bike to my cousin's for the duration of that weekend. I adored him and my aunt and uncle. We were big into Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, World Online, i.e., anything popping in the early 2000s, and we had a slice of it. Sorry for the rambling, I was just painting the picture. So I got to my dad's house Saturday morning, hung out for about 30 minutes, and decided to call up my cousin. Mind you, summer is transitioning to autumn. Of course, he's home, so I get permission and start my trek. Alone, mind you. I can't remember why I didn't have my bike, but I remember it not being there. As I start walking, the clouds get gray, and it begins to drizzle or sprinkle. I'm not too worried about it because I'm halfway there already, and my clothes shouldn't get soaked due to this. As I pass a relative's home and before I get to my cousin's, there's this long curve that swings right. Once directly in the center of this curve, there are nothing but trees and dense brush on both sides, with no houses in sight. Again, in the center, to your left before the brush thickens, there's a small patch of grass about 3 to 4 feet high. I'm walking and getting to this curve, and as I get to the center of the curve, the rain gets a bit heavier. As the rain hits the pavement, I tighten my shirt collar around my neck to help keep it dry. As I'm doing so, I start hearing rustling in the small patch of grass to my left. Thinking it just could be a deer, I turn left and see it. It was a big, tall, humanoid-like creature. It had its back to me, walking oddly or slowly into the woods. It was about 7 feet tall and approximately 30 feet away from me. I ducking froze. I just stared at it. It was completely engulfed with black hair, and down its back on the left and right sides, there was a thin white vertical line running down both sides. Now this is going to sound stupid, but it looked like a 7 foot tall, 2 leg skunk with no tail. As soon as it got to the wood line, I booked it. I remember running on the center yellow lines of the road to make my escape more quiet, and the rain helped with that as well. As I escaped the curve and it straightened out, I could see my cousin's place, and I didn't stop running until I reached the house. I tried to tell my cousin about it and my family, but everyone just wrote me off. I mean, I was only 13 and have no proof, phones nowadays didn't exist during this time, and if they did, we couldn't afford them. So no one believed me. I never walked down that road again. Now that I'm older and moved out of state, about twice a year I go down and visit some family around that very road, and every time I pass that curve, I look to see if I can see it again. So, I'm a First Nations person from a reservation in Canada. I grew up in different reserves with different family members. We all have a common factor, if something about another being is bugging you, then someone is inviting it. We believe this is a negative outlet. Anywho. This happened when I was 7 years old. My sister and I were visiting our Nokum and Nimuzum's house. The adults decided to go to bingo, and they got the eldest cousin there to babysit everyone, his name was Cory, who was 16. My grandparents' home has a few trees around it that they planted, and outside of that is a straight field to the next mile, they farmed. We were outside all day there, my cousin Cory was sitting on the patio as we were all jumping on the trampoline, and he was watching us. I went inside, and when I went back out, I jumped up on the edge of the patio to jump off onto the trampoline. My sister, who was five, and my other cousin, who was five, were already on the trampoline when I stood in my way. I was telling them to move as I was about to jump, but they were completely fixated on the field, so I looked towards the field. There were two things coming towards our area in the field. The field is about a mile long, but you could see two huge black things, like hopping, coming down the field. They'd come up and then down, like a snake taking a peek, in perfect unison. I called Corey and pointed towards the field. He told us all to get inside the house and lock up, 
as he didn't know what they were. We did as we were told. I don't remember much after going in, but it was like I just came in and I was crying. My sister was beside me crying, and my other cousin Charlene, who was about 11 at the time, was crying while holding my little cousin Cass. I got up to go to the front door, and Corey was running back in. He said those things were circling the house, he was trying to run across the road to the neighbors, the phone just stopped working, and it was just a bunch of kids home. I went back to the couch to sit with my sister, so we could comfort each other. When I got to her, she told me to look out the window, so I did. Those things were looking in, they had their hands against the window as they peeked in, they looked like crocodiles but were shaped like humans, their face wasn't as long as a crocodile, they had five fingers but they weren't human fingers, they had long nails with like crocodile skin, and they walked standing upright. They had this, like, long black cloak or something on. They stood at the window for only a few seconds and took off. Not long later, our grandparents got home with my uncle, and we all went running to them crying, telling them what happened. My grandparents are very traditional and told us they had to leave and needed us to go to my aunt's, on another reserve, my aunt came to get us not long later. My uncle was upset, so he drove around the field looking for whatever they were. But when we all jumped into my aunt's retro van to go to her house, those things were behind Nimuzum's quad set, and then they ran south. I always thought this was a dream, but at one family gathering, I mentioned it to everyone who I recall being there, and they all remembered it. But what are your thoughts? So about two summers ago, I went to a bonfire in a set of woods in the mid-Michigan Sanford area, to be exact. The woods did not feel right the entire time I was there, but it was a large, lively party, and I wasn't going to say anything. I was drinking, so I might have mistook what I think I saw, but anyway, I remember when we were leaving, I was lying in the back seat, looking into the woods. When I saw a tall, very pale, and lanky creature, its arms were incredible thin, and it had an oddly small head for its size. I only saw it for a few seconds, and again, I was intoxicated, so I could be off, but I didn't know whether it was a possible cryptid. It's mid-November. I forget exactly what year it was, but it was either 2013 or 2014. I'd either be 12 or 13. My brother is in the Cub Scouts, he should be around 8 or 9. This was a family camping trip, one of the rare ones his troop held. We're in northwestern Maryland. We arrive at the campground, and my brother is running around with his friends from scouts. Parents are talking with one of the scout leaders. We're a good 50 feet from the woods, so I decide to go explore. As I get into the woods on the path, I notice that there is a huge slope with a stream at the bottom. It's a pretty huge slope downward, probably like a 45 degree angle if I had to guess about 150 feet down. I get to the bottom, and after that, I'm just watching the stream run. On the other side of it, there is a vertical hill. There is no slope toward the stream. At the top, I see a tall figure walking alongside the trees. Now is the time. I had no idea what a Wendigo was. This figure is pale and lanky. Its head was obscured by some foliage and branches, I don't think it saw me. It went deeper into the woods, and I lost sight of it. A couple moments later, some of the moms with their kids came up with the same idea as me to check out the stream, I didn't mention anything. Nothing else happened on the trip. It was actually a lot of fun. I never really gave thought to it at the time. I got into a lot of true crime and unsolved mysteries in my late teens that kind of led to cryptids. I came to find out that what I saw was a cryptid associated with Native American legends. Now, I don't personally think it's a spirit or something. It was always in the back of my head. But I never heard anything about what it could be. But I know damn well that I don't want to go back into the woods after knowing what I know now. I was in the 6th grade when I had my first real encounter with a supernatural creature from Appalachia. I live on a small off-road in the middle of the woods. Only about 13 give or take houses are on my road, so it's quiet at night. When I was a child in Appalachia, I was taught things to avoid any supernatural confrontation, but it was bound to happen one day. Some rules that I learned were, never be out alone after dark, if you see it, no, you didn't, if you hear it, no, you didn't. Things along the lines of that. It was January, and I had gone over to my friend's house, which was about three houses away from mine, so not far. But it was winter, the sun goes down early, and I had lost track of time. It was six o'clock and pitch dark outside. When we realized how dark it was already, she offered for me to just sleep over since she knew there was a possibility of me running into a supernatural creature. But I insisted, so I just walked home. She then offered to walk me home so I wouldn't be alone, again, I said no. So I went outside into the frigid, icy air and walked home. I had my phone flashlight on so I could see a creature from far away in an emergency. I walked home as normal, 
looking at the beautiful icicles and snow piles everywhere, and thought, I'll be fine. I was wrong. My driveway to get down to my front door is steep and goes down fast, and at the end are the woods. It's been in the woods for at least five miles. I walked down slowly since there was ice everywhere, and then I heard rustling in the bushes at the bottom of the driveway in the woods. I pointed my flash down, and I saw a wolf, but it didn't look normal. Living in the northeast, I see many wolves, but this one looked demented. Wolves won't strike at you or run up to you unless you provoke them, so I thought it would all be okay. I was about halfway down my driveway, and every step I took, the wolf looked more and more demented. It had glowing eyes, and it was very big to just be a wolf. At that time, it started moving towards me quickly. Another rule I learned as a kid was to never run from one of those creatures. But I did run. My front door was locked, but I had a key in my hand. It took me what felt like forever to unlock the key as it jiggled in the keyhole. My anxiety was so bad, and even though it was 20 degrees out, I was sweating like crazy. Finally, the door was unlocked, and I ran in. There is a window right next to my front door, and I looked out the door, and there it was. A skinwalker shapeshifted into a wolf. Its eyes were beady and cold, it was hungry. I looked away, scared of what would happen next. After about a minute, it was gone, never to be seen again. Every night for about two months after that, I was spooked enough to even close my eyes to sleep. It got so bad that I had to start taking melatonin. I'm mostly fine now, but here and there, I still feel like this wolf is watching me. It still spooks me to this day. I have always been an open-minded person when it comes to the supernatural, but I have never had any encounters until the day my best friend, my girlfriend, and I went to Colorado Springs and visited a place called Garden of the Gods. My best friend Noah had told me that he had heard rumors of people reporting sounds of Native American yelps and drumming. Now, I had no idea if he had been reading this from a reliable source or not, but I didn't think much of it anyway. So what do we do? We decide to go at night. Nobody else was there but us and the animals that lived nearby. We went to the top of this hill, and somewhere deep in the brush, we heard a bird whistling. Now I had whistled back, but to get this, it tried to mimic it. After a few tries, it was whistling, just like me. Now, this didn't scare me at first, I had actually found it cool. I thought maybe it was a mockingbird of some sort. We decided to turn around, though, because the whistling was getting closer. Our walk back quickly turned into a run when we heard the sounds of it chasing us, whistling over and over. We could hear it moving through the brush. No bird is that big and runs that fast in such thick woods. I'm not sure what we encountered, but it definitely was nothing I had ever seen before. Who knows what would have happened if we had stayed. Could it have tried to hurt us? Or maybe it was just something that wanted our help. Hell, for all I know, it could have all just been a prank. Someone pulled on three teenagers who didn't know what they were doing in the middle of the night. Again, I want to state that this is a true story, and I did not make this up. If anyone has any ideas or clues as to what this could be, then comment below. My boyfriend and I recently went to Lapland. While we were in Rovaniemi, we did a snowmobile tour to search for northern lights through the forest. Our snowmobile happened to stall or die on us while we were mid-tour. We called over the guide, who then proceeded to shake the snowmobile vigorously to get it back to functioning. While he was on it, shaking it back and forth, my boyfriend was standing to the side in the snow. A little brown or black ball, an animal of some sort, jumped from under or out of the snowmobile towards my boyfriend. It made a small footprint in the snow where it had landed, and we searched extensively, trying to find its pathway in the snow or burial further where it landed, but nothing. We come from Oregon, USA, with many small animals and creatures in forests, but we haven't seen something like this and couldn't understand where it went. If anybody has any idea what kind of animal or so, that would be awesome. I would love to know what we saw but couldn't find. To get straight to the point, today, around 5 p.m. on the west coast of Sweden, already pitch black outside, me and my dad went for a walk in a forest maybe 10 minutes from civilization without any lights, trail without street lights, no flashlight. I saw the trail fairly clearly, we often take walks together and were talking about something mundane. We were right next to a lake, and we noticed a big group of maybe 50 ducks just chilling in the water close to the beach. Out of nowhere, maybe 25 meters in front of us, a creature ran across the trail from right to left and continued down towards the lake. Quickly disappeared out of sight. I'd say about 150 centimeters tall, on four legs, although the front legs looked much longer than the hind legs, like a bipedal creature running on all four legs or arms. Beige or brown. Really ducking fast runner. Made no noise except the sound of running. All the ducks in the lake freaked out and started flying and screaming, 
which feels like weird behavior if it was, for example, just a deer running past, although I'm not a wildlife expert. Just after the creature ran past, a very heavy smell of iron or blood permeated the air. Both of us could smell it. I've never experienced a smell like that before, and I work in a hospital and deal with blood often. Personally, I'm fascinated by these kinds of events and definitely believe in different possibilities, but my dad's a hardcore skeptic, realist, and science-loving man. He grew up on a farm in the middle of Sweden's forests and is very familiar with Swedish wildlife. He says he's never seen anything with that shape before, or anything that fast. We don't have many big mammals here at all, the closest possibility is a deer, but they usually never come that close to people, and I've never seen one move that fast. And all their legs are roughly the same size, of course, not like this thing that seemed to have a significantly larger upper body. I say goat man because of the iron smell that's always described in legends about the goat man. I'd love any sort of input on what you guys think this might be. Animal? Humanoid? If humanoid, what kind? All and any thoughts are welcome. When I was in high school, some friends and I went tubing down the river. It was twilight by the time we were walking back up river to where we'd parked, and everything was lit with that weird, flat blue light that happens around that time. I was near the back of the group, with just one friend behind me. As I walked past a path down to the river, grown up with tall weeds on either side of it, I suddenly stopped short, it honestly felt like I was physically unable to continue walking. I had seen a figure on the path, and I wanted to turn back to look at it. It was the only thing I could think of. I need to go back and look at what I saw. As I started to turn around, the friend who had been behind me caught up, calmly took my arm, and whispered, I saw it too. Keep walking. She pulled me forward, and as she did, I felt like I was waking up from a dream. I suddenly could not recall what the figure had looked like, just that it was human shaped and standing upright, doing nothing, as far as I can remember. I will never forget how tense my friend seemed, though, and how determined she was to prevent me from going back for a second look. It's been 15 years, and the memory still makes me feel uneasy. This one takes place in the early 1960s. It happened to my father and his older sister. He was around 4 to 5 years old, and she was 12 to 13 years old. This is my aunt, who has shared the story for more than 20 years now. This is 100% true. At that time, my father was living with his family, his father, his mother, and his sister, in his native village in Africa, Ivory Coast, West Africa. It is a small village of around 1500 to 2000 people. When they were not attending school, my father and my aunt accompanied their parents to their field. So to explain a bit, in our country, it's not like in Europe or the USA, where the fields are near farms. There, the fields are located far from villages, sometimes at 5 to 10 kilometers in the dense forest. So every morning except Sunday, villagers are walking 2 to 3 hours through the rainforest to reach their fields and work, and around 4 p.m., they make their way back, again through the forest, to return to the village before dark night, carrying either food or firewood for cooking, or sometimes both. There is no road, just narrow trails in the forest. It can be scary, but usually, it is pretty safe if you stay on the trails. Sometimes you can meet snakes, foxes, monkeys, large birds, and other kinds of animals. Before, there were elephants and big cats, but there are no more now because of deforestation and poaching. Well, that day, my father and his elder sister accompanied their father, my grandfather, in the field. Everything went normally as usual. On their way back, since grandpa had a lot of loads, he walked more slowly, so my aunt and my father, who had just little stuff to carry, walked faster and pulled ahead of him. My aunt walked in front of my father, and they did not speak, eager to get home. The trip was off without a hitch. Suddenly, at one point, my aunt had a strange feeling of emptiness behind her. She turned to see that her little brother was not behind her. Surprised, she started shouting the name of my father, unanswered. She started to panic. Since he was behind her, whatever the place where he could be, it should be only behind her. So she threw her charge and began to run, redoing the way while shouting the name of his little brother. For several minutes, she saw nothing. Then, at one point, she spotted several meters in front of her on the trail, which she described as a tiny creature, around 1.10 meters to 1.20 meters, and this little creature walked carrying a little boy on its back. She said that the creature seemed to have its feet positioned upside down. She stared, shocked, then she shouted loudly to the creature, hey you, to ensure that was what she thought. The creature turned back to my aunt. It was not human, and that was definitely my father on its back. When the creature saw my aunt, it started running, still with my father on its back. 
my aunt started running to pursue it too. The creature left the trail to outright get into the dense forest. It was not counting the determination of my aunt, who entered her turn in the forest. She pursued them through the forest for several minutes. Since she was more agile and faster than the creature, which was slowed by a charge on its back, she finally caught it up. She lunged at him, screaming, give me back, my brother. Give me back, my brother. Grabbing her brother and pulling him back. The creature also grabbed onto my father. Then, seeing that my aunt was clinging, he let go of my father, who fell to the ground and just vanished before her eyes. My father was groggy and looked like he was in a daze. My aunt took him by the hand, and they went out of the forest to go home. Once at home, when he regained consciousness, grandpa and grandma, my aunt had told them what had happened, asked him how he ended up on the back of this creature. He said he saw no creatures. He said he walked behind his sister when the creature appeared to him as the doppelganger of his father. It came from behind, asked him if he was tired, and asked him to climb on its back to go home. So he agreed because he thought it was his father. During all this time, and even when his sister was pursuing the creature, he saw himself on the back of his father. My grandpa was 1.75 meters in height and the creature was 1.10 to 1.20 meters. Until he fell to the ground. The incident did not occur again. They never knew what had attempted to kidnap my father. But I know that until today, sometimes there are cases of disappearances through the forest, especially children. When I was a little girl and I sometimes went to the fields, we were asked to always stay in the group on the trail and not respond if we heard someone call us in the forest. Late one night, in July of 2019, I was driving on a back highway, somewhere in southern Missouri, I think Highway 60, southeast of Springfield. I was the only vehicle on the road for what seemed like quite a while. I had my high beams on, keeping my eye on the road, listening to music, when all of a sudden, some humanoid creature ran at a high speed across the road in front of me, causing me to swerve to avoid hitting it. I grew up in the Midwest, so I am not unfamiliar with things crossing my path at night, but this creature left me absolutely terrified. I have never seen anything like it before or ever since, and I have absolutely no answer as to what this creature was. It was running on all fours, but it was big. I want to say probably four feet from the ground to the top of its back. It looked like a tall, lanky humanoid with bare skin and bones, long black hair, and a sunken face, with empty eyes that glowed white, like an animal in headlights. When those eyes met with mine, pure terror came over me, not understanding what I was seeing. The closest thing I've been able to find that even slightly looks like what I saw would be some drawings of skinwalkers and or crawlers. This happened while I was doing my army service in Switzerland. I am not allowed to talk about what we were doing, but I'll try to keep things clear. My company had installed a huge antenna, and it had to be guarded by two soldiers day and night. We were on top of a hill, far away from any city, and near a huge forest. It was 1800 hours, and I had just started my watch of 6 hours with another soldier. Everything went fine, we smoked cigarettes and kept ourselves occupied until our watch ended at midnight. Then, we received a call from our superior, and he told us that one of the soldiers that was supposed to take the watch couldn't come, and one of us had to stay for another 6 hours. We tossed a coin to see who would stay from midnight to 6 in the morning with temperatures of minus 20 Celsius. Of course I lost, and I had to wait for the other soldier to come and join me for the night watch. They sent Jon Snow. No, I'm kidding. They've only sent another soldier, but not the best, because I knew he would sleep all night when I saw him climbing the hill with his sleeping bag. And that's what he did, he immediately took refuge in the tent and fell asleep. It was the coldest and longest night of my life, but nothing special. The weird part happened in the morning. We received another call from our superior, and he told us that we had an NBC exercise, which means that we have to wear all day long our anti-chemical suit, I don't know the English word for it, the one with the gas mask, and everything that goes with it. I was really upset and exhausted because I wasn't able to sleep with that thing on, and sleep was my only reward for that 12-hour watch. Well, I got out of the tent, and this is where I saw something that still scares me to this day. There was a woman standing next to the antenna. And she wasn't moving, she was just standing there, 5 meters from the tent. I couldn't see her face because the sun was starting to rise behind her. I knew she was a woman because she had really long hair and had curves. Remember that we were in the middle of nowhere and this lady was standing there, not moving like she was frozen? I started to freak out, and I called the other guy to show him what I was looking at. I don't know why, but he wasn't scared at all, and he told her to leave because she wasn't allowed there. But she didn't make a move, she just stood there looking at us, or at least in our direction. I was so confused about how a woman could ignore two soldiers telling her to leave a forbidden area. I mean, we are in Switzerland, 
the army is not that impressive, I know, but people usually don't do this kind of thing, they just move away, especially when it's 6 in the morning. And what was she doing in the middle of nowhere, obviously not dressed for this cold weather? How long was she standing there, and how did she end up here? I didn't hear any footsteps. So many questions went through my mind at that moment, the other soldier didn't think twice and started walking towards her. When he almost reached her, she started running very fast. She ran directly into the forest. I saw her getting deep down in the forest, and she disappeared from our sight. I'm really a rational thinker. I question everything and think that there is always an explanation. For me, the explanation is that she was simply a jogger because of the way she ran to the forest, but. Almost three minutes have passed between the first time I saw her and the moment she started running away, three minutes of not moving at all, looking at me, dressed in something really tight with minus 20 degrees, and in the middle of nowhere. Thank God there was someone with me, because nobody would have believed me. If anyone knows what I encountered, please feel free to leave a comment. I'm not even sure if I want to know. The Creature of Cibolo Creek Bear County, Texas 13 miles southeast of the San Antonio suburb of Converse is a narrow lane pathway called Skulls Crossing. The gray pavement of the roadway traces its way across the rolling countryside before nearly vanishing into the thick forests along Cibolo Creek. A low water crossing on the creek dips a motorist into a tranquil setting, and for a brief moment, the thick woods block out the rest of the world before rising onto the open prairies. The countryside is almost picturesque, in a fairy tale way, but little would a traveler know that they had just driven through a scene from a horror story. It was shortly after the Civil War, so the stories claim, that a veteran of the defeated Confederacy moved his family to an acquired stretch of land along the wooded embankments of Cibolo Creek. Reconstruction was wreaking havoc in the eastern portions of Texas at the time. Crime was running rampant. Rumors of underground resistance were stirring up gossip about a continuation of the war, and bandits were scouring the countryside. Bear County seemed to offer a refuge to this former soldier. The lands around San Antonio were once prosperous before the Civil War, but a massive rebuttal from the Comanches had swept like wildfire through the region during the conflict, and most of the settlers had moved away. To brave the isolation along Cibolo Creek was a danger that many did not want to risk. But the land was cheap, and to a man who had just lost the majority of his fortunes in a hard-fought war, the rolling countryside southeast of San Antonio offered a chance to start anew. According to what has been said, the man selected a house site not far from a landmark known as Skull's Crossing. His wife and young son helped establish a large farm that grew into a sizable piece of property. For about three years, the family lived in subtle happiness in their home along the cozy confines of Cibolo Creek. Around 1868, though, their lives would change in a terribly tragic way. The winter of 1868 had been especially harsh. Little rain and bitter cold fronts froze the early year crops, and the rainy seasons of spring were virtually overturned by a drastically hot summer. By September, a drought had settled into the hills north of San Antonio, and the rivers and creeks were barely flowing. Residents along Cibolo Creek were reporting destroyed fences, animal pens, and corrals. Local gossip stated that animals from the hill country, such as mountain lions and cougars, were starting to drift southward because of the lack of water in the mountains around Blanco and Cudes Mill, present-day Wimberley. Early one morning, around mid-September, the 13-year-old son of the family woke to find that their chicken coop had been busted up badly. Feathers were strewn across the floor, and puddles of crimson grime indicated that the birds had been the prey of a very large predator. Huge prints in the muck resembled a massively oversized dog with long claws. However, the family noticed that the length of the feet seemed strangely similar to that of a person, but a giant of a person at that. The footprints led off towards Cibolo Creek, and giant or not, the predator had destroyed a valuable commodity on the family's farm. It was going to take most of the day to repair the chicken coop and another to get into San Antonio to buy new chickens. Needless to say, the father of the family was in no mood to put up with a prowling killer. Lending him a hunting rifle, the father instructed the 13-year-old to follow the trail of the animal as far as he could. If the boy was to come across the predator, he was told to shoot it and bring back its carcass so that the family could sell its hide when they got into San Antonio. Excited to be dispatched on his very first solo hunting trip, the boy ventured off toward Cibolo Creek, feeling like one of the early explorers he had read about in his school books. Armed with his father's heavy musket, the boy trudged into the woods like a true frontiersman. The tracks of the animal led towards the old wagon ruts of Skulls Crossing. Determined to find his prey, the boy slipped through the thick woods as silently as he could, following all the telltale signs of a retreating predator. At long last, the broken branches and the scattered white feathers of stolen chickens led the boy past the creek crossing and to a rise in the rocky embankment. 
a foul stench drifted up towards him, and he stealthily peeked over the edge of the hill and saw a heart racing sight below. Lying at the edge of the creek was a naked man. He was fast asleep but was surrounded by ripped up and broken chicken carcasses. There was dried blood strewn across the rippled flesh of his bare back, and held tightly in a clenched fist was the severed head of one of the family's largest roosters. The man reeked of a thousand terrible scents, and under his long fingernails were layers of thick dirt and plastered mud. This was the predator that the boy had been tracking, he was certain of it but was scared of how to proceed. Slowly and quietly, the boy turned away so he could report the stranger to his father. It was late in the afternoon when the boy got back to the farm. When he first arrived, his father was scolding him for not having returned with a prize. But the boy told him all that had happened and about the strange man he had discovered in the creek bottom. Thinking that the man was possibly a Comanche, or worse yet, a loon who had escaped from a mental asylum in San Antonio, the father and son rode to the nearest neighbors to get help. Once a small crowd was collected, the boy led the men towards the area of the creek where he had seen the man earlier that afternoon. It was nearly dusk by the time they arrived, and a plump full moon was rising in the first fingers of nightfall. Stretching out in a long skirmish line, the men started advancing into the darkening woods. Approaching Cibolo Creek, the boy was trembling with each step he took closer to the rocky overlook where he had seen the strange man earlier. But knowing that his father and neighbors were close by, his bravery was not hard to recover from. All the men could smell the horrid stench that the boy had described to them. As they came closer to the creek, they started to hear a deep and almost guttural sound from the sand directly below them. At the edge of the stream was a hunched back figure that seemed to be in agonizing pain. Thick gray hair, blackened at the roots, was spouting from the bare flesh of a human torso. The bones and joints on the figure's body popped and snapped as loudly as the brush that they had trampled through. With eyes that were turning as ferocious as a hungry predator, the beast rose its frame towards the sky, and the last features of a human face cracked into those of a wolf. The father of the boy stepped boldly up to the overlook and locked back the hammers of his twin-barreled shotgun. A spray of buckshot exploded through the air, and the massive beast stumbled into the dark waters of Cibolo Creek. As the smoke of the blast started to drift towards the blackening sky, the creature let loose a wailing howl that was deep with rage. Other men started firing at the creature, but the volleys that struck had little impact on the thick hide of the monster's muscular chest. Bounding up from the rocky creek bed, like a tree that had suddenly toppled towards them, the beast leapt through the air with a snarling growl. The father of the boy, quick with veteran reflexes from the battlefields, stepped swiftly out of the way, and the wolfman pounced upon his son with no effort at all. A bulk of animalistic muscle, possibly more than that of a grizzly, crushed the boy's body in the blink of an eye. Claws, as sharp as the blades of Yankee bayonets, ripped through the child's soft flesh like thin paper. With a mighty snap of its powerful snout, the beast tore through the boy's clothing, clasping onto the firm meat of his arm and torso. Dozens of revolvers sang loudly through the woods. With bullets striking him, the beast tore off the boy's arm and went charging past the pose, disappearing into the heavy blanket of night. The boy's father was helpless. It has been said that he just stood above his son's lifeless body in shocked, utter silence. There was nothing that could be done, and as the howling wail of a wolf shook the stillness of Cibolo Creek, the father dropped to his knees and wailed just as loud. That was the only time that the werewolf of Cibolo Creek was ever seen. The posse tracked the creature as far as they could, but eventually the trail went cold, and they were forced to retire. After that harrowing night in September of 1868, the ones who had witnessed the monster said that it was eight tall, as big as a gorilla, and was wolf-like in appearance. The same witnesses also claim that after burying the tattered remains of his young son, the heartbroken father fell into a swift and unrecoverable depression. It's commonly told by some that the man eventually committed suicide and that his wife returned to her family. Others state that he set out on a solitary mission to track down his son's killer but never returned. Either way, Skull's Crossing became the core of a local legend. But it seems that the tale grew too popular, and at some point in time, the original name of the wagon road was altered to the contemporary Skull's Crossing. Whatever the reason, there are not many today who claim to have heard the wailing shrieks of a wolf-like creature at Skull's Crossing. But there are not many who know of the legend today either. Me, 19 meters, and my friend, 19 NB, were walking home from a walk out to in and out at around 10 o'clock to 11 p.m. We decided to take a cut through that runs by a local food co-op and some railroad tracks situated behind the food co-op. The cut through would lead you straight to the railroad tracks behind the food co-op. As we approached the food co-op, I saw the silhouette of what looked like a man leaning or hunching over. Almost like how in some zombie media the zombies sleep hunched over while standing up, or sort of like how some people on heavy amounts of opioids look as they're nodding off while standing up. 
Its head or face was facing the ground at a slant, and its back was ever so slightly slumped or arched. At first, I was just confused about why a man would just be hunched in front of the railroad tracks like that. Other than that, oddly enough, I thought nothing of it. I might have been a bit zoned out, as I struggle with mental illness and I often zone out. Sometimes to the point where I just forget where I'm walking, and whoever I'm walking with at the time has to direct me where to go. The meds don't help with not being all there mentally either. Although, when working effectively, they'll either reduce or completely suppress the chatter in my head that makes me zone out. Once it started to move into the light, I gradually started to realize something was off about it. I forget if it was moving in an odd way or not, but it just seemed off. This is when I started to realize something wasn't right. The figure's arm stretched upward in a weird way. It looked lanky, and its arms looked longer than they should be. Its proportions were just off. It looked semi-dark gray. Once I saw the figure's arms, long, outstretched upwards, and moving in an unnatural way. I paused for a second, then told my friend to book it, pretty sure I also yelled cryptid, and we booked it for the part of the street that intersected with the closest street away, parallel to the street the co-op was on. I looked back in the direction the figure was first seen. It began approaching a person on a bike who was biking slowly in a sort of aimless way. Slow to the point that he couldn't keep the bike steady and was sort of swerving to keep it upright. The person on the bike didn't seem to react, seemed to care, or simply wasn't concerned. At this point, the figure was practically on top of the person on the bike, and the person on the bike began slowly pedaling in our direction, still swerving to keep it upright at the same slow pace. This actually might have happened before we ran, but either way, we began walking further away. Before we turned the corner, the bike changed directions and began heading south down the street that was east of us and by the co-op. The figure's arms were now and had been, since it had approached the bike, outstretched in a weird action figure-like stance, with its upper arm slanted forward, downward, and slightly outward, and its forearms extending directly forward. I wonder why the guy on the bike wasn't phased. For all I know, the figure was actually just a person in poor lighting. Or perhaps the guy on the bike was going slowly, as he feared the figure would chase him if he went too fast. My friend thinks the figure was just a guy carrying water for the guy on the bike, but they stated that they never saw much of the figure, whereas I noticed it more. Something doesn't seem right about that explanation. I couldn't tell if it was wearing clothes or not, as the lighting was poor. I coughed either light glimmering off its torso or a vague impression of a bluish shirt. But given the figure's proportions and the way it held, something was off. Last week at my friend's farm, Northern Illinois. It's a large plot with a forest to the north, our bonfire was near his barn, about 100 feet from the woods, with crops to the west and south. Twelve of us were at the bonfire. We're all around 15 years old, and five of us, myself included, own a FID card, which is required to possess or purchase firearms. The bonfire is going as planned, and at around 10 p.m., we light it up. All of us are chatting and having fun when one of my friends stops everyone. That friend was sitting near the crops. Listen. Everyone shuts up, and we hear a really strange noise coming from the field. It's nearly impossible to describe perfectly, but it was a really deep hissing noise. If a large dog could hiss, it'd sound like that creature. My friend, whom we'll call T, shines a flashlight toward them. From that distance, the light was hazy, but we saw a figure about 30 feet away from the fire. It was on all fours, about 5 feet long. It had large, powerful looking hind legs coupled with feet that had claws. They were small, but they looked lethal. But its front legs were long and stringy, with much more menacing claws. It was covered with fur, and its head was dog-like, with large canines visible. The creature's eyes were deep blue and reflected the light. The party right now is struggling to comprehend what's happening. Most of us are just staring at the creature, which in turn is staring back at us. This continued for at least a minute until T came to his senses. I'm going to sneak back to the house and grab my guns, yell if that thing does anything weird. T leaves, and the creature watches, its eyes following T as he enters the house. At this point, we have three flashlights on it, and they are perfectly visible to us. Two minutes later, the door opens, and T comes out with two. 22s and a 9mm. The creature sees T and gets on its hind legs, I'm assuming it's a biped that was sitting down in the field, running toward the woods with a huge gait. Now the thing looks at least 6 feet tall. T hands me the 9mm and hands my other friend, R, the second. 22. The creature's 20 feet out from the forest, and T shoots at it, missing. R stays at the fire while me and T go after it, only now do I realize how stupid we are. The things are at the foot of the forest, and they climb up a tree. We both stop and fire a few more shots into the trees. We walk back, 
and everyone decides to call their parents and finish it up early. Our excuse was that a small downpour had started and we had to finish early. No one's talking about it, and we're not planning on telling our parents. T's parents led two more hunting trips, with bows and arrows due to the strict gun laws, but we didn't find anything. The tracks it left were washed away during a harsh storm. So two questions. What the hell did we see, and has anyone else seen it? I live in a rural part of Donegal, Ireland, and my family is very superstitious, with quite a few connections with local paranormal and cryptid folklore. There are multiple stories of encounters with the same creature, and myself and a few trusted friends are working on getting video evidence of its existence. This thing didn't look like any other creature I've read about here or online. My first encounter starts on a cold January evening. I'd recently stopped seeing a girl, so I had a lot of extra free time. I decided that day to meet up with an old friend of mine, we'll call him Jay. We had been sitting in his house talking when we started talking about what we used to do when we were younger. I was nearly 20 at the time, and he was just turning 18. When we were around 13 and 14, we used to spend our entire summers camping and exploring a forest not far from both our houses. The forest wasn't big compared to some of the massive forests in America or continental Europe, but for our county, it was one of the biggest and oldest forests. It was mostly old oak with some areas of evergreen trees and then areas of thick brush, which not many other people had explored to the extent that I and my friend had. We'd often come across strange things in that forest, dead animals ripped apart, even a dead cow, but never thought much of it, writing it off to foxes or stray dogs. We'd gotten bored of sitting in the house that night and decided to go up to the forest for nostalgia's sake. Now at this time of year, it gets dark around 5, and this was around 9.30, so it was pitch dark. We drove to the mouth of the forest and parked the car. We started our walk in, we had a particular spot in mind a few hundred meters into the forest where he and I used to sneak to when we were younger to hide the fact we were smoking from our parents. To most people, the forest was haunting during the day, never mind at night, but from all the time we'd spent here when we were younger, there was a homely feel to it now. After about 20 minutes of walking, we were at our old spot. Memories of our younger years started flooding back as we stood there again, smoking a cigarette, and we were joking and laughing. About half an hour had passed, and the usual noise of leaves blowing in the wind had started to hushy, and crickets had gone quiet. The moon had become more obscured by the trees in here, barring a few spots that were more illuminated than others through the canopy. At first, I thought I could hear footprints or see the odd silhouette in the distance, but I put it down to just my mind playing tricks on me. Then came the sound, the unmistakable crack of a branch breaking. It was a bit away from us, but it echoed through the forest with purpose. Then came another, almost intentional, and soon more followed, gaining pace, each sound closer together. Then it happened, a younger tree, maybe 15 feet tall but still with quite a thin trunk, fell maybe 20 meters away from us, just pushed to the ground. I caught my first glimpse of it then. There it was, maybe 20 meters away from me, on all fours, it looked to be about 4 or 5 feet tall with piercing red eyes. It rose to its hind legs, and it was huge. I'm about 6 feet, and my friend is slightly taller than me. We both played rugby, so we weren't small guys, but this thing dwarfed us. It was staring right at us, waiting for us to move. We started pacing back, keeping eye contact with it. It started walking towards an old tree and outstretched one of its lanky arms, and within seconds it was in the highest reaches of the tree. Its burning eyes were still staring at us. We started to run back to the car, and we could hear the creature coming through the trees above us. We burst out of the forest and got into the car as fast as we could. I turned on the lights and illuminated the forest in front of us. There they were, those glowing red eyes, about 15 meters into the tree line. The creature dropped out of the tree and stood on its back legs again. The lights gave us a better look at it. It had a long, shiny black nose, it must have been between 8 and 9 feet tall, and it was covered in black wiry fur. It had lanky arms with long fingers. It bore its white teeth and began walking back into the forest on its back legs. The weirdest thing is that both me and my friend felt some sort of connection to it, as both of us have family members with paranormal histories. We knew if it had wanted us dead, it could have killed us easily, but for some reason, it let us live. I have a few more experiences with this thing, and as I said, myself and a few friends are investigating further to find out what exactly it is, so if you want to hear any more about it or have any idea of what this thing might be, I'd love to hear what you have to say. Okay, so it was the summer of 2015. I was at my friend's place. I will call P, and his older teenage cousin happened to be there on this one day. I will call L. It was school break in the summer, and since Christmas and summer happen at the same time in Australia, we were mainly talking about what our families were doing for the holidays. 
Eventually, P's mom told us to take the dogs for a walk. We thought that it was a bit strange since she usually only lets us stay in the backyard by his old treehouse and his pool so that she could keep an eye on us, but this one day we just told us to go, that will be explained later. For reference, P has two dogs, a male golden retriever and a female Caucasian shepherd. I will not say their names, but both dogs had quite long hair that had to be shaven due to the hot summer. So anyway, we began to walk them, and after a while, since it was hot, L said that we should take a trail in the nearby bush so that we could get some shade. We all agreed, and so we went into the bush. For reference, the bush is basically the Australian version of the woods. Usually in the summer, you don't go into the bush due to snakes, but we wanted to get out of the sun. Anyway, after about 10 minutes of walking in the bush, both dogs stopped. The golden retriever starts to whimper and tries to run away, and the Caucasian shepherd stands her ground, simultaneously sniffing the air and growling. L quickly checked for snakes, but there were none. I did a quick 360 and saw it. At first, I thought it was either a kangaroo or large dog, which was hiding behind some trees and looking at us for about 17 meters, which in USA mathematics is about 55 feet and 9 inches. Its body wash that looks like a kangaroo, but with light brown hair, human arms with short claws at the ends of the fingers, and a mastiff-like head. So to warn them but also not sound crazy, I yelled out to them, what is that kangaroo doing? P and L looked over and saw it, and both said something along the lines of that ain't no kangaroo, mate. It both simultaneously ran or hopped at us extremely quickly. I clearly did not like that I called it out. I barely had time to move, and it jumped on me. The Caucasian shepherd jumped up, biting its arm. P fell forward and let go of the lead to let the dog do what it had to do. Since a Caucasian shepherd dog can have a bite force of up to 700 psi, for reference, a lion only has a bite force of 650 psi, you know that this creature was truly in pain. I was basically pinned to the ground as the two were fighting above me. The Caucasian shepherd did manage to move from the arm to the creature's neck, but somehow this didn't kill the creature. The creature barely pulled the dog's neck off, L grabbed a large strike and swung at the creature, which made the creature turn to face him, allowing the Caucasian shepherd to jump on its back and bite down on its shoulder. Clearly too injured to continue, the creature got the Caucasian shepherd off itself before it ran or hooped away into the bush out of sight. We all just ran out of the bush as fast as we could to get back to P's house. We needed an adult, so P ran upstairs to get his mom since she wasn't downstairs, but all we heard from upstairs was a scream from P's mom as she brought him downstairs by the ear wearing lingerie with a man in his underwear who was not P's father walking downstairs behind her. She was pissed, Aussie slang refers to someone being either drunk or extremely angry, in this case, she was not drunk. Since I had a few scratches and the Caucasian shepherd had a few scratches, she realized that something was wrong but, of course, didn't believe that a kangaroo man attacked us. So Al just said that it was a feral large dog, and she told the man to leave her home, which he did. The Caucasian Shepherd unfortunately died in 2019 due to her injuries. While the Golden Retriever is still alive and well, P and L said nothing about P's mother's situation to P's father, but he somehow found out and got a divorce. As for the creature itself, after doing some research online, the most likely thing that it could be is a skinwalker, but I do have my doubts as I live in Australia and not the USA. I'm a Jersey native, sadly, born and raised, and I was about 12 or 13 when my entire family went camping in the Pine Barrens, which is where it's said to be born. Ever since I was little, I've been into occult stuff, so I already knew about the Jersey Devil, and I was one of the oldest cousins, so I can't tell you how many times we searched for the cabin that it was born in. Also, I should mention that we used to go camping there all the time, less and less as we got older, but the point is that we did this often. So, I remember it being the first night, we on average would spend a week, and I remember we watched the movie Coraline that had just come out, and I loved it. I'm mentioning this because I had a pretty fun night before I encountered it, so it wasn't a nightmare-induced hallucination or anything. So, another fact is that my family didn't like to actually camp, we had RVs. So it's just my dad and me in our camper, and it had one bed in the back, and I slept on the couch that pulled out to be another bed. My dad closed all the blinds we had, and I was next to the biggest window in the camper. Little me is asleep and happy, and then boom, I wake up from thunder and lighting. I remember not liking how loud it was and not being able to go back to sleep. So, I'm just laying there listening to the storm, which must have been right above us because the lightning was frequent. Okay, so now this is where I think I'm hearing something. Footsteps. I thought I did, then I was like, humph, just an animal. But they started off quiet and, of course, got louder and louder. And closer. I'm still not thinking anything yet. 
I mean, I was still freaked out, but again, I was certain it was just the storm. In a matter of seconds, it was like, oh duck. Not the storm. Mind you, I'm facing the window up against the wall so I could look up the blinds and see a tiny bit of outside. This is important information because that's when this mother ducker came up to the window. So, I'm shitting my pants, barely breathing, because in my head, I'm like, what the duck just stomped up to our RV. Again, this all happened very fast, and the lightning struck, boom. It looks like a horse is looking into the RV. Honestly, typing this, I can still hear a ducking breathe on the glass. I only saw a little of the bottom of its chin, I guess. This might have been my imagination, but I'm pretty sure I saw what looked like fangs, and once that lighting struck, I spun around so I wasn't facing the window anymore. I regretted moving at all, and at this point, I'm holding my breath, begging that whatever is out there didn't see me just now. So, lightning strikes again, and I see its shadow, almost as if lightning were striking directly behind it. It looked like a horse. It definitely had the same size head as a horse, but the top half seemed to resemble a goat. It looked like it had spiral horns, or at least something that made the top of its head look weird, and something went off in my brain that was like, oh no. Also, please remember that I was only seeing what I could from lightning strikes. It starts to make its way towards the front of the RV, and like I said, all our blinds are shut, so as soon as I heard those loud ass footsteps making their way towards the front, I basically jumped from my bed into my dad's. I laid down behind him and didn't want to make too much movement, but I was shaking him and trying to get him up. He said something like, Nico, just go back to bed. He knew I wasn't a fan of storms, so that was probably his first, still half asleep thought. Just to paint a clearer picture, I'm up against the wall behind my dad. There's a window in front of him and one at the top of our heads. The footsteps come around again, and since I'm behind my big dad, when the lighting stuck, I could only see the weird top part of its head, the ears and the horns, I guess. Anyway, it was there. Looking in. Like I said, I can still hear that mother ducking heavy breathing because it was terrifying. The most confusing thing is that when it left and headed towards my aunt's campgrounds, so did the storm. In the beginning, when I initially woke up from the storm, I guess it must have been close. I guess, in my theory, that maybe since this asshole was so loud with its hooves and breathing, maybe that's what it does. Creates a storm, so it can still be stealthy. I've dealt with people who have led survival camps and have spent years in the Pine Barrens with no signs whatsoever, but that's what's so intriguing in my opinion. I mean, it is an entity. It could probably make a storm if it wanted to. So as it left, the storm calmed down, and I finally got back to sleep. In the morning, of course, my dad and aunt didn't believe me, and going outside that morning, the ground was semi-wet, but I remember there being no footprints. Another quick fact I forgot to mention is that we were in an RV. I mean, if this was some sort of nasty horse walking around, it would have to be at least 8 feet tall to look out the window like that. Unless it was standing on its back legs. That was my big argument to my aunt and dad on why there was no way it was a horse. I live in Jersey City now, but I'll never forget that camping trip. It happened so fast, but it takes forever to tell. I used to visit my aunt and uncle in the summer when I was little. They were actually my great aunt and great uncle, my mom's uncle and his wife. They lived on a farm that is now part of a housing development in North Liberty, Iowa. Their farm was basically everything north of Dubuque Street on the east side of Highway 965. Keep in mind that we're going back 40 to 50 years, so the last time I was there, 2019, it was completely unrecognizable except for one or two identifying landmarks. I was there with my two cousins who lived on the farm and one cousin who lived in Chicago, and I also came to visit for the week. One night, I suggested that we go camping in the clearing. It was just a 100 foot by 100 foot area in one of the fields that my uncle cleared out. I don't know what the purpose was, but I know he had a trailer with farm stuff in it parked out there. As soon as I suggested the camp out, the two cousins who lived there got freaked out, saying, you never go outside at night. My cousin from Chicago and I were making fun of them, but they stuck with it, and I could tell they were terrified. We asked why they don't go outside, and they said it's the ticky man. Tall, lanky, skinny, and makes a tick or click noise. Supposedly, he was out to kill anyone who stayed in the fields past dusk. This sounded ridiculous, but even my uncle said, it gets creepy out there. And this was a good old boy who had about 300 pounds of muscle and a beer belly. He actually looked like Macho Man Randy Savage back in the 1980s, plus a belly. Seriously, he had bodybuilder arms and legs, and then this fat man had a beer belly. It was funny. He always had two or three guns on him because the farm had bobcats running around. I was eight to nine, so I wasn't thinking of that when I suggested camping. 
Anyway, no one else wanted to camp except my cousin, and my uncle said no. Before bed, my uncle warned us, if you get up at night, don't go outside. There are lots of nasty critters. That's when my cousin said something like, but you guys sit on the porch half the night. My aunt said something like, yeah, but you never set foot off the porch at night. I felt like I was getting set up for a spooky prank. It felt so different. We go to bed, and I'm talking with my Chicago cousin about the big prank. We wait for a bit after aunt and uncle go to bed. Then we grab some flashlights and wander onto the porch, half a wraparound porch. We start daring each other to take one step off the porch. And we're jumping off and then jumping back on. It's all BS. There's no ticky man or anything out here. We sit and talk, and then decide to go find a stick. Don't ask. We were kids. Finding a stick to whack things with seemed like a good idea, so we started walking to the woodpile behind the pole barn. About 100 feet from the house, we hear a clicking noise. It's like a trilling noise. We freeze and listen. Tick 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 tick. It's fast but also close. We start walking backward toward the house. We hear the noise, we're squinting into the darkness, waving flashlights, and I can still remember how my heart was pounding painfully. This was not fear. This was dread. Just as we were maybe 20 feet from the porch, my flashlight lit up a creature behind a tractor. It looked like an anorexic gorilla. You could tell it had a big body but no meat on its bones. It had reflective slash glowy green eyes, and as soon as my flashlight lit it up, the ticking noise got louder and faster. It took one step toward us, and we started screaming. The porch lights came on, and my aunt started screaming, get on the porch. Get on the porch. We ran as hard as we could. We weren't far from the porch, but we heard feet pounding behind us and a labored breathing like a winded horse. As soon as we were on the porch, the footfall stopped, and the trilling started again. We tried to find it with the flashlight, but it was nowhere to be seen. My aunt started screaming at us about how she warned us and that we were to never leave the house at night. Then she was hugging us and telling us we were okay. It still felt like a prank. I mean, it scared the hell out of us, but seriously, a weird ape-man creature? GTFO. The next day, my uncle took us to the feed store, and on the ride, he was so serious. He warned us to never leave at night and to not even look out the windows at night. So, what did we do that night? We looked out the windows with our flashlights. We were upstairs and had the window open because the flashlight was glaring off the window and we wanted to see what was out there. My cousin started making tickling noises to bring it out, and out of nowhere, we started hearing the trilling. We swung those flashlights around and finally hit them back in the same place as before. It looked good, but it was far off, so we still didn't have any good details. We also figured we were safe in the house, so we felt more bold. We flashed it and tried to get it to move closer. All of a sudden, he broke into a full run toward us. I freaked out and slammed the window down. The next thing we heard was a loud thump. It landed on the roof, the little roof overhang above the porch, just outside the window. It was clear as day. It had a face that looked a lot like a sloth, but it looked purely evil. It rubbed its face up against the glass window as it stared at us. It bared its teeth, and our bedroom door just exploded open. My uncle was there with a shotgun, and he started screaming. I don't know what he was yelling, but half was directed at us and half was meant to scare off the thing. For the rest of our trip, we were terrified, and we were required to sleep in my aunt and uncle's room so we didn't get up to no good. After that year, we never went back. They sold the farm off in parts to developers and other farmers. They bought a house in town and retired. Sadly, both cousins passed away, and my aunt passed away. My uncle was on his own, and my mom asked him to move in with her and my stepdad. My Chicago cousin and I went to visit him, and we finally asked what the ticky man was. Keep in mind that he was in his 80s or maybe even early 90s at this point. He just said, he killed them. He killed them all for me. One by one. I asked who the ticky man was, and he said, it's evil from the ground. Bad things in the ground come back as more bad things. My Chicago cousin tried to push for more information, and my uncle said, I said all I'm going to say. That was it. I know what I saw. I don't know what it is. And to this very day, when I see a picture of a sloth, it makes my heart beat faster. It sounds so stupid, but that was something that scared the hell out of me. It seems even scarier because no one will discuss it. The farm cousins would freeze in fear at the mere mention, and aunt and uncle would just tell us to shut up about it. Something was going on out there, and it still scares me to even think about it. I have had numerous encounters in my life with both spiritual and tangible events of a paranormal nature. The first story is the most unsettling for me. On our days off right after high school, 
my cousin and I would routinely drive my parents' golf cart around the neighborhood and into the back of the large neighborhood because it was abandoned and completely overgrown. We knew all the abandoned construction trails through the forest and where they met back up to the roads, which were completely unbothered by any suburban houses. It was broad daylight, probably around 2 or 3 p.m., and we had parked the golf cart coming off of a trail and toward the concrete roads into the back part of the neighborhood. The grass on the unused lots was covered in weeds and grass that was probably 5 or 6 feet off the ground. We unleash the pipe. We take a few hits. All is peaceful. The birds are singing. The air is clear. He takes another hit and passes it to me. I start to light the bowl, and before I take a hit, I hear my cousin say my name twice. Very seriously. I panic and think the cops have just pulled up or something. I look at him, and he's staring straight ahead, shocked, and just says in a low voice, what the duck is that, cuz? I look up and down the road, and I see it. It's a little man peering out from the grass on the left side of the road, about 20 feet away. It looks like he is a naked humanoid completely covered in mud and crouched down as low as a person can go while still being mobile. It's not human, but it is human-shaped. With both of us staring at this creature, he backs up slightly, and then, it still disturbs me to remember this, the roadie runs faster than humanly possible across the concrete road and into the grass on the other side. It was like a human moving as fast as an insect does when it panics. Imagine crouching down as far as you can without falling over and then sprinting. This thing appeared to do just that. No words are needed. I disengage the parking brake and gas it. We drive all the way to the front of the neighborhood to the community center area, which is probably a mile away, and decide we should probably just go home. Lots of frustrated what the duck was that? S followed because there was no rational explanation at all. We still talk about that story all the time. Funnily enough, about a year ago, my parents moved to a bigger house about a hundred feet from where this happened once the neighborhood started building back there again. The second story must have been about six or seven years ago, maybe a year or two after the first story. Very general timeline, but you get the idea. I was hanging out with a friend and his girlfriend, as well as his weed dealer, whom I had kind of known for a long time. I had stopped smoking weed by then, but everyone was good company, and I would have a few beers while they did their thing. After a while, it became apparent that we would have to give the dealer a ride back, and we decided that we would all go together and could just take my car, so we did. It must have been 9 or 10 in the evening. The dealer's house is a straight shot down a main road for about 15 minutes. We get on the main road through the city, and everything is completely normal for a while. We're almost to the neighborhood, and suddenly, police lights. Aw, duck. We pull over into a well-lit gas station right in the middle, and the whole routine unfolds. The officer accused me of pulling out in front of somebody trying to make a right turn, despite us having all green lights and riding in the middle of a three-lane road. His reason for pulling us over was soon incomprehensible, but he ended up recognizing the guy in the front seat, the dealer, who fortunately didn't have anything on him. So cut to waiting around, three more cop cars, and the drug-sniffing dog. Of course the dog hits off on nothing, and we get the whole kit and caboodle of stepping out while they search the car. Here's where the fun starts because they begin pulling out a lot of my occult stuff, like an atham and wooden chest full of sigils and candles, and some other mobile all-purpose stuff. Ha ha ha, what are you guys? some kind of devil worshippers? I roll my eyes. I open the trunk for them. There's nothing in there but a black robe and Ouija board that I've used for years. Of course, they take both out, wave them around, and make fun of it all some more. The encounter ends without any great dramatization because, as expected, they found nothing. I loathe that they had tossed around all my tools, but I'm a pretty level-headed practitioner. We drive the dealer to his house, part ways, and head back to my friend's house to mess around and have a few beers. I head home at around 2 or 3 and go to bed. Let me warn you that I have never had sleep paralysis or apnea, I don't dream particularly often or spectacularly, and I cannot recall a single instance of experiencing a hallucination in my life. So when I see things, I know there's more to them. I don't wake up. I am still asleep. I feel like my spirit has been brought to the surface of deep water. I open my eyes and sit up, but I cannot see. There is a really weird noise, a rhythmic whooshing, that is bringing me to awakeness. My vision slowly expands outward from the center with a blue tinge, which is very unusual. I immediately become aware of the fact that I am not alone, and I look into the room that expands out from the foot of my bed. It glows blue because of the moonlight coming in from the windows at the opposite end. A few feet out from the foot of my bed is a high-top round table with two high-top stools on either side. I can hardly see it, though, because there is a perfectly silhouetted goat man-looking being, perhaps seven feet tall and very wide, 
sitting on the high top stool closest to me and facing my direction. He has moose like horns and is the source of the whooshing, as he is breathing very heavily, just like a runner after a hard run. I cannot see his features, but he is obviously looking right at me, and I'm looking at him. I blink. I am experiencing sleep paralysis, I think. I blink more. I become very afraid that there is really a seven foot tall goat man sitting in my bedroom, as this is not a usual predicament that I have to face. I probably stare for about 10 seconds before I get hit with a sort of communicated feeling that the being had just come from doing something very awful to some people, one person in particular, and then rushed here to alert me of it. The breathing slows a little after another 10 seconds, and the being moves to get off the stool, the table behind him shifting and creaking as it does so. As soon as he hits the ground, he just fades out. I'm baffled, I'm afraid, but I'm relieved. I get up and turn the lights on, walk around the house, and everything is effectively normal. I sit and think about the whole thing, and the police incident didn't even connect in my head for probably 5 or 10 minutes. I go out for a smoke to observe the lake out back in the sky because the moon is bright and beautiful. It might have been a full moon, but I can't really remember. I calm down and go back to bed, having been relieved by the connection between the events that I made. I don't remember what time this happened because I never looked, but it seemed like the middle of the night. I never had any further happenings in the vein of this experience or saw anything in the night, and I've never seen the being again. The last story wasn't super long after the Guardian of the Ouija board, probably less than a year. I worked at a movie theater during this whole time period, and I took to jogging at like 2 or 3 am after work. Perfectly serene and safe, and there was never anybody awake or driving around. The house was on a small, triangle-shaped configuration of roads situated around a lake, with only one road going through the forest to get back to the main neighborhood. That road out was on the other side of the lake from where I was. Anyway, I come out of the garage, start walking down the road, and shortly come up to the first right turn. The orange of the street lamps keeps the roads pretty decently lit, but the orange lamps cast a spooky feeling. As I round the corner on the sidewalk, I see another jogger down the way on the other side of the road. I think about how odd it is to see another jogger at this time of night, so I slow down and kind of stare. It occurs very quickly that this is not another jogger because most joggers are not 8 foot tall ghostly shadow beings taking 6 footsteps. Due to the confusion, I don't even feel anything as I watch this tall, lanky shadow being run all the way down the road, right in front of me, and in between two houses and into the woods. He made absolutely no sound at all. As he passed right in front of me down the middle of the road, I saw that where his hands and feet should be, there was nothing but a fade to mist. Otherwise, he was just a three-dimensional absence of light. After seeing that and taking a moment to process, I decided that if an interdimensional shadow being was running at a full sprint away from something, I probably should be too. So I turned around, noped out of there, and went back to my garage to sit in existential terror. After about 30 minutes, I decided that I was going to conquer my fear and run around the triangle like I intended to before having a paranormal incident. I succeeded, terrified, and luckily nothing happened on that attempt.